Welcome everybody to the August 26th Chesapeake Rotary meeting. Uh, glad to see everybody here on such a beautiful day. Uh, Baxter Ennis, could you please lead us in prayer? I'd be glad to. Lord, we just thank you for this day. Father, we thank you that you have put us in this country, this amazing country, United States of America. We ask for your blessings on it, Father. Please help us through these difficult times with uh, the COVID virus and with the unrest in our cities. We pray for healing for our nation. Father, we ask you today to bless our time together, bless our speaker and our police department here in Chesapeake. We pray all these things today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Baxter. Tara Preston. Hello. Hello. Could you leave us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? Yes. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Brett Nielsen, could you lead us in the four-way test, please? The four-way test of the thing for you to say or do. First is the truth. Second is the very of all concern. Third, will it be the will of better ambitions? Or will it be the better ambitions of all concern? All right. Everybody can take their seat. And if we can bring up the man, the myth, the legend, our sergeant at arms, Chuck Wilson. <laughs> Luckily, I can live up to that. So. <laughs> humbly, humbly. Anyway, I'm told we have no guests other than we're all just uh, inside uh, the club here today, other than our speaker. Uh, any happy bucks? Harry. Yeah, I do. Uh, this is a big one for me. Here's 20 bucks. 20 bucks. Uh, to make a long story very short, on Sunday afternoon I went for a walk and I felt like this pain in my chest. And on by Monday at this time I was having a stent placed in my body. So uh, thanks to the club who supports Chesapeake Regional Medical and thanks to the good people there, um, I had a 95% blockage. As my son in law, who's a physician, calls it the, the widow maker. And I have never had more energy, and I have no restrictions on my heart. The only thing to worry about is what they, they do. They, they go up for your thing and do it, that's what this is. So, man, I'm glad to be here. Glad to be here. To talk. Wow, Harry, thanks for sharing that. That's fantastic. Two days ago. I'm not thinking that anybody else has anything to quite compare to that, but uh, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> we'll move on to anyone else with uh, some happy, happy bucks. All right. Well, we'll move forward. Oh, we're having a good, uh, good viewership of our uh, Facebook live stream. Uh, and... Uh, uh, Make sure if you're not able to make it that you check it out, or if there were some meetings that you didn't get to, they are still available. They will remain available to uh, to, to watch. Thanks. And Harry, just so you know, uh, I come from a family where my father had, I think, seven of those stents, and uh, it's a lifesaver, and I'm very glad to hear that you're doing well. Um, as for the Facebook Live, of course, we are doing that, as Chuck stated. Um, there has been a talk by some of the members about possibly doing a Zoom meeting, so there could be some participation for the folks who are watching on video. Um, we'll look into that. I've only gotten feedback from a couple of people about it, so before we try to recreate the wheel, um, if anybody who is watching is interested in trying to do something through Zoom, um, it may require us some more equipment or something along those lines, but if enough people contact me, just shoot me an email, let me know that they're interested in doing it, we'll certainly uh, be more than happy to look into doing it. Um, with that being said, Baxter Ennis, could you please come up and introduce our speaker today? Right. Thank, Thank you, President Jonathan. We appreciate it. <laughs> Folks, we are so glad to see everybody here. What an amazing story, bud. You're looking surprisingly good here. I, I, 
for anyone who's my, I'm 63, I've never been on drugs. You know, I've never been on drugs either. I've never been on drugs. 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 I've never been
what's going on with COVID, what's going on with the state of disarray, particularly in some of our major cities. And they all mostly center around law enforcement. And we've had the good fortune to be exposed to a lot of different agencies and people, organizations, since then, asking us how we do things. And particularly organizations that want to engage law enforcement differently than they particularly have, and wonder why they have not seen some of the things that have happened on the national stage occur in Chesapeake. And when you meet with certain groups and you show them what you do and why you do it, they're absolutely amazed and absolutely pleased that we have been on the forefront of community engagement. That we have, for the most part, have so many different programs to reach out to our diverse communities, to our young people in our communities, so that we can establish relationships with people and the way we even train our people. Um, you know, I always tell our officers that what we practice here in Chesapeake is kind, compassionate, professional law enforcement. You, you say, well, what is that? Well, you know, I always tell people that there's a lot of things in life that don't re really require a great deal of effort. It costs you nothing to be kind to someone. It costs you nothing to be compassionate, have empathy for your fellow man, and to be able to demonstrate that in a way that you establish a rapport with somebody. You know, I always say that human beings, it's amazing to me why we fight so much against each other when we, if we talk with one another, we discover that we have more in common than we have that divides us. And so for us, we try to get our people just to talk to the people that they're dealing with. Don't see that person as a problem to be solved, but help them to realize what it is that they need to do so that we don't get called to intervene as often as we do. And I teach the ethics portion to our um, incumbents and to our new entrants, teach ethics. And I also work for the Virginia Association's Chiefs of Police. And you always talk about ethical conduct. And years ago, I ran across a quote by John Wood that says, I want to make sure I get it correct, be more concerned with your character than your reputation because your character is what you really are, while your reputation is really what others think you are. And I always use that because it's important to me that we build people of good character. Really, when people ask me what we are looking for in law enforcement, I'm looking for two things for the most part. I'm looking for good character, and I'm really looking for people who are good communicators. Because most of our problems that we encounter require you to talk to someone. Really, it requires a, an interaction. And how that interaction occurs greatly affects how people see you and, of course, the end result. But let's be honest. When people call the police, they're always calling us when there's a problem. Nobody calls us when things are going good. They always call us when things are going bad. And so here we are in this situation where people are you know, experiencing some very difficult, some negative event, and they're looking for someone sometimes to just vent to, or someone who can help resolve your problems. And sometimes you just have to be there to allow people to vent. Because some problems, I gotta be honest with you ladies and gentlemen, we can't solve. There's some problems that people have that we cannot solve. They lie beyond the law, they lie beyond the ability of law enforcement and government to solve. So with that regard, when we go back to community policing, we have to be able to identify resources that we can point people to so that we can try to help them get resolution to their issue that they're going through. So when you talk about character, you know, what are the character traits you're looking for with people? Well, first and foremost, we're looking for someone who is honest, you know. You see, you tell us what took place as it took place. We're not looking for perfect people because we know that there are no perfect people. You know, along those same lines, I often say, I'm amazed at how often we end up with some of the outcomes that we do because we have imperfect people responding to an imperfect person in an imperfect situation. And sometimes we walk away from it really with a very good outcome. 
Our biggest challenge, though, is still, like I said, making sure that we get people of good character, people who are trustworthy, people who are honest, people who are empathetic, people who are committed to the task at hand. And in these days, uh, I was just speaking with Grady, he asked me earlier about um, hiring people and, and applicants. Um, throughout my career, particularly the last 20, 25 years, I have been involved in the hiring of people. And up until this last go around of hiring people, we have never lacked for applicants. Even when we had the Great Recession, we had far more applicants than my competitors or my peers, because they're, and their competitors <laughs> in the other cities than, um, than ever before. But this recent um, hiring um, cycle, we have really seen a dearth of um, applicants, of people who are wanting to be in law enforcement. And certainly attribute that to what's going on um, in the media and around the world. So what lies before us is that great challenge of hiring people and retaining them. And along those same lines, it has to do with how is it that you keep your people engaged? The people that you have on staff, how do you keep them engaged? And how do you keep them positively focused so that they are not easily swayed by the daily bombardment of what's taking place around the world in the media? You know, by raising hand, uh, show of hands, how many people don't have a cell phone that, that's tied to the internet? Okay, see what I mean? So all of us have the ability to get information, literally, at our fingertips, whether it's via social media or an app that takes us to whatever news outlet that we want, even those that will send you push notifications about what's taking place in the world. So our young people, they're just like anybody else. You know, they're at home or they're at work and they check their cell phones and they see the news feed and they see what's going on. And I would dare say that the negative things that they see has a corrosive effect upon their psyche and their feeling of well-being. And when you see um, people protesting against law enforcement, talk about defund the law, law enforcement or you know, all these other different things, it does have a negative effect on people. So my challenge is to keep them focused and to give them something in counter to that, to counter that. And again, bring it back to me in the chess group. I count myself blessed to be in chess group because I can tell you, if not daily, four times of the week, someone will either call my office, email my office, or show up at one of our precincts to deliver something to our officers. I get an email from a citizen saying, I really appreciate you guys, what you guys do. I'll get a phone call from a citizen. I'll get something in the mail from citizens telling me how they had an encounter with an officer. And contrary to everything that they've seen in the public or have seen in, in the media, that that's not what took place. The officer was kind. Oh, gosh, she was incredibly helpful. He really did this or she really did that. They took the time to do this, that, and the other thing. And so what I do is, if I get it via the email or get it via, um, via the normal old mail, I photocopy it and I send it to out, out to the troops. And I'm amazed at how the officers will respond and say, hey, I really appreciate that. It's good to know that people see us differently than they do what we see in the media. Because there's that other side that really does not get a lot of media attention. I'm serious. Ladies and gentlemen, 99% of the stuff that we do is really, really positive. And even some of the negative things that we are involved in, the people who are getting the services that we provide are really thankful that we're there. I'm an African American. And one of the things I keep seeing in the media is that African Americans don't want more police in the neighborhoods, so or they don't want police in the neighborhood. Well, the actual data says that's not true. The data says that people who live in African American communities want more policing, and they just want good policing. That's what I have to tell the officers. Look, guys, don't be discouraged by the things that you see in the media. There's more to the story. And we actually get emails from people of all persuasions saying, hey, we really appreciate what you guys do. We think you guys are fantastic. Um, 2016, I think it was, 2016 and 2000. 
18, 19. There were uh, two surveys done by Old Dominion University about the quality of life uh, in Hampton Roads, South South Hampton Roads. And it asked about um, law enforcement services. You know, what is your opinion of law? They asked a whole lot of questions, but also asked about law enforcement services. And I'm happy to say, I'm proud to say, humbly, that you know, Chesapeake really rates very high, number one. Uh, in 2016 and number two in 2018. I mean, not in the last study, but just behind Suffolk. Uh, and even in the African American community, we rate very high. So it tells me we're doing some things right in Chesapeake. Are we perfect? No. But we are striving each and every day to identify those things that we can do better. And of course, the big thing is being able to tell your story. About a month ago, um, city manager, myself, uh, and the mayor, I believe it's the mayor, uh, we met with, yeah, the mayor, we met with um, some black pastors. And they asked me to tell them some of the things that we were doing in the police department to make sure our people are better trained, um, the, the number of complaints we get, and so forth. And when I was able to communicate with them, you know, uh, our complaint system, how we handle it, how many we actually review, the findings, and so forth, they were absolutely pleased. And I said, you know, our challenge is being able to tell our story. Because that's that's what it really comes down to. It's, it's not that you're hiding anything from them. It's just that you're so, I'm a lawyer. I am committed. When I first became chief of police, I told everybody, you know, I love my wife, but I'm committed to the child. And my, my wife heard it, and she didn't like that. But I, that's who I am. I am committed to what we do. And I expect everyone that works for us to have that same commitment to what it is that we do, which is to provide the best possible services that we can to the community. But again, our challenge is to be able to tell our story. So while I'm busy doing the day-to-day -day things, what have you, we have to have people who are able to tell our story or we have to find different ways to be able to communicate our story to what's taking place. And I do believe that that's why you have not seen a lot of people um, coming out saying that there's problems wrong with the Chesapeake Police Department. Um, I have the good fortune of speaking with my peers in um, some of the other cities, and they talk about the riots or the demonstrations and the protests that they've had, and we are all in agreement is that you know that what we're seeing take place across this country was predictable. And by that we say that there have been incidents that are high, um, intense, uh, very visual, for which law enforcement has not been candid speaking out against. When you see something that is just wrong, we are not afforded the ability anymore to longer to just simply say, uh, let the judicial system handle it. You have to say that this is something that's wrong. And we are seeing this take place across this country where sometimes you have to simply say, you know what, our profession, we're not perfect and we have bad actors in there and they need to, to be dealt with. Because all they have done is made it really bad, really difficult, harder for us to do our job here across the country. You know, I don't know of many professions where someone can do something 3,000 miles away. Uh, it's, you know, it happens on TV and people start protesting, you know, in, in a city where nothing really t has taken place. So, again, for us, the challenge remains to make sure that we're hiring the right people, that we're equipping them and training them to the right standard. Again, I count myself blessed to be in Chesapeake because Chesapeake has allowed us to make sure that we spend adequate dollars to properly equip our people and to properly train them. And I'm, I can't tell you, um, I can tell you that when budgets get sliced and they're cut, one of the first things to you know, municipalities go after is you know, your training budget. But for us, we value the training that we provide our people to make sure that they're able to go out there and interact in a safe way and hopefully get the best possible outcome of some of the things that we do. We have, we approved for 401 officers. Uh, I was just telling uh, Ms. Ritter that we are about, I just, I have two classes in session right now. 
One will graduate last part of September, the next one will graduate February, March. But uh, I have 20 vacancies, 20, 25 vacancies right now, which is very low compared to some of the other cities. I was talking to um, my peers in the beach in Norfolk and Forsman. They have a lot of vacancies. They're having trouble filling vacancies. So when I told them I only have about 20, 20 vacancies, you know, I got the slant eye. I said, guys, I'm sorry, but you know, if you, you know, do things like we're doing, perhaps you'll be able to fill your vacancies as well. Um, we have some really great people who do great things day in and day out in law enforcement. How they interact with people, how they solve the problems. Um, but I think the biggest issues, if you were to ask me today, where do I see our biggest challenges? One, uh, dealing with people who have mental health issues. The mental health system, um, the practices that are, or the options that you have available to deal with people who are experiencing a mental health crisis. Um, they have put law enforcement uh, at the forefront of dealing with that. And many times, it is not a law enforcement issue. But we're the ones that you can pick up the phone any time of the day and literally get somebody in minutes to show up at your door. Uh, I do believe the General Assembly is trying to address that to do something different than they currently do, but we view it as the 20 or let's see, I think the officers get a little over 55, 60 hours of mental health training. If you think that an officer can diffuse or um, really solve someone who is having a severe mental health crisis, and the officers only had 50, 60 hours of training dealing with something like that, to think that they are able to resolve that situation favorably, I think that we are selling ourselves short. We're not being uh, candid with the public, and we're not being candid with ourselves to think that, that that's a good solution. So we have to develop better processes and solutions to deal with those issues. But I think that's the number one big issue, and I think the second big issue is how do we, as an organization, ensure that the people we hire themselves remain emotionally and mentally okay? I can tell you that the officers respond to a host of calls, literally. It is literally from nothing, the mundane, the routine, to some things that are absolutely horrible. Um, you know, like uh, a few weeks ago, uh, we had a child that was left in a car accidentally and died uh, in the heat of the day. You tell me how do you, at the end of the day, having dealt with that, go home to your own children, or even if you don't have children, how do you process that? And you know, not months from now, you know, even at night, you know, months from now, whatever, not think about that and what that means to that child, to that family, and so forth. So the things that they see, the things that they do that are the exceptional things which we investigate and see, you have to worry about their emotional and mental stability. Um, I will say that the city manager has a work group together, uh, putting together, has actually established it to review not just it for public safety, um, but having spoken with Ms. Parr uh, and um, CIBH and uh, Jill here with um, Human Services, we believe that there's a number of people who are part of that critical care unit who see things daily. Uh, whether you're a prosecutor, if you're a prosecutor and you go through case files of child abuse or homicides, whatever, you're seeing things that the average person does not see at all. And you see these things over and over again and so forth. Uh, you know, uh, mental health workers, our people who respond to neglected adults and neglected children. They see these things and they are left to deal with them. So for us, we believe that it's, it's the right thing to do to make sure that we have processes in place to make sure that uh, the people are evaluated on a uh, regular basis. And if they see something that we know that is so egregious, so significant, that they uh, are referred to. So we take away the stigma. We take away the stigma of seeing a clinician. If you're required to go see a, um, a clinician or a counselor, what's, what's the stigma as opposed to you voluntarily seeking? Someone will not think that you're weak, or we mandated based upon 
time on the department and an assignment. So we think that that's the right thing to do. And I think that those are the biggest challenges that we have in law enforcement today. And back to the lady in the world that I've been rambling. <laughs> and then my time's about up. But I'll be more than happy to take a couple questions if we have time. Yes, ma'am. We've actually seen crime go down. Um, we predicted two things would occur. One, the domestic <clears throat> calls would go up, which they have, and but they've leveled off in the last two months, and that um, burglaries would go down because people are home, <laughs> and they have. So there has actually been a about a 14% overall decrease in crime. Yes, sir. So you talked about before about getting the message out. Mm -hmm. You pass it on the good things that should go on, the bad things that you get from the general public. You pass it on to the, the fellow troops that you have. Do you have a public relations department that's also communicating that? Because it's, you're right, nobody ever sees an article in the morning saying, hey, 8 million people survived in New York overnight. Exactly. You just wait for yeah. about the 15 people that died. This one. And so getting out the positive message, I think, would help. And as part of my budget request, I've asked for a social media consultant to, <laughs> to, to <laughs> but it, 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 you don't have to worry about it, it was, it was denied. It, it was denied. But we think that you don't need a police officer to handle social media for you. There's, you can find some part-time uh, young person who is a college student or whatever to help computer promote, savvy. exactly, help a computer savvy who can help promote your, your uh, your organization, and I think that's the right thing to do. It's amazing to me how in tune young people are with the various platforms of social media. Thank you. Uh, Chief, one question I have, when I see these uh, shootings by a place like the Kenosha, different places, I'm always wondering, what are we doing as far as procuring and training in non-lethal weapons? Back to that's an excellent question, and that's part of our training. Um, we have the tasers, which is the electric, you know, conductive weapon, but we also train our people in defensive tactics as well. When I saw the situation that occurred in Kenosha, I was like, why did they just tackle this guy? You know, I don't know whether that was lack of training or what have you, but I was like, if you see the guy going to the car, you have plenty of opportunity to intervene before he gets to the car and the unknown is there waiting for him. But we we train our people in that and we do it as insurgents as well. But we're also thinking about changing the evolution as well because as clearly indicated, officers use hands-on more so than anything. Um, along the same lines, again, we have the taser, which is very effective, but it has restrictions. We didn't want when I was given the proposal for the tasers, I was very cautious to make sure that officers don't use this as a universal tool. So we prescribe very narrow its uses, usages. If I'm allowed to tell a story. Um, about three months ago, we had a call of a young man who was stealing something out of 7-Eleven military at Campbellstone Road. This is like six in the morning. The officers arrive, they see the young man walking down the street. The officer engages the young man, he pulls out a box cutter and continues to walk away. The officer pulls out a sidearm. The next officer arrives, he tells him he's got a knife, use the taser. He holsters, they use the taser on the young man, they get him in custody. So the key is, is to make sure that you know, even that you train to a certain standard, and that you follow up and make sure that people are indeed doing it. So when we have something very positive like that to, to occur, we use that as a training video. That's the good news about our, our body-worn cameras, is those things that really work well for us, we said, this is what the standard that we train you to. This is how you should be dealing with these types of situations. And we, I'm not gonna say we got lucky, no. We ended up with a good resolution because our people responded the way that we trained them. Yes, sir. Uh, I think uh, I sure appreciate you coming out today and, uh, and listening to you talk. I feel even better about our city 
Uh, and it helps to explain something that I witnessed. And it would be great if it was partially or at least uh, captured for social media. But a few months ago, and things were you know heating up around the country, a lot of racial strife and so on. Uh, and, uh, police interactions were not uh, always friendly. But I was approaching the intersection at the battlefield in front of uh, the uh, Oak Grove United Methodist Church, one of the worst intersections there is, <laughs> pouring rain. And apparently a truck had you know, like dumped a sea of vegetables into that intersection. And as I, there were at least a dozen people, you know, all colors, you know, and two uh, white police officers and they were getting all these vegetables off of the all the roof, off to the side, and then there's high fives. And, you know, everybody was loving on each other. Yes. And I'm like, that made me feel so good about where we are. Yes. Actually, can I get two minutes to tell one of the stories? Yeah. Let me tell one more story. I had a, um, a Zoom meeting with um, some pastors. And at the end of the meeting, one of the pastors, he's a pastor of the church in Rome, he says, Chief, I, I want to take a moment to compliment one of your officers. He says, I have a parishioner who um, had a domestic situation with her boyfriend in Norfolk. It got very violent. Our use the city, so I might as well say, Norfolk PD arrived and did not handle the situation well at all. Okay. He says, I know the law about domestic assault, and the young man should have gone to jail. He says, somehow the young lady ended up in Chesapeake uh, at the magistrate's office. She encounters a Chesapeake police officer. She tells the story, and the officer says, I don't know what the officer didn't do, why he didn't do his job and all, but let me help you out. He guided her through the process and what have you. He says, I want you to know that that officer he, I know he did not have to do anything for her because it happened in another city, but I appreciate the fact that he took the time to do this for that young lady. He says, I know your department is different. He says, I don't have the officer's name or nothing. I sent out an email to all the officers and said, hey, this happened. Whoever did it, can you just show up at my door? <laughs> About 10 minutes later, the officer shows up. I was like, I appreciate what you did. I really did. And I then sent an email to all the officers saying, hey, this is what happened. Somebody in Norfolk saw this and said, they really appreciate what you guys do day in and day out. Can you thank that officer? That's what we do to make sure that officers indeed have a different perspective of what's really going on and how much they really are appreciated by you. Chief Wright, thank you very much for coming here and speaking to us today. Um, as I've been saying to a lot of these speakers, this is not the greatest time to have your job. Uh, last week's speaker or two weeks speaker when we had the superintendent of schools, it was more dealing with the whole COVID crisis, but with a lot of the unrest that's going on in this country right now, I know your job is not the uh, easiest job, so we appreciate it. Um, I think Chuck's sentiments about the department probably go beyond this room for Chesapeake about how much uh, we appreciate the work that you and your officers do for us. All right, so next week is our club day. Um, but the following uh, guests will be here for the month of September, just so you'll know. We've got Michael Barber from Parks of Rec, who is coming on September the, sec uh, excuse me, September the 9th. We've got Nancy Welch coming September the 16th. September the 23rd, we have our Commonwealth Attorney Nancy Parr. And then September 30th, Michael Berlucci with the uh, Chrysler Museum will be here with us. So, uh, I've given everybody a heads up. Hopefully, we will see uh, a rise in attendance. Today is very good. I'm happy to see everybody here. Yes, our speakers do follow. Definitely, no questions. All right, with that being said, is there anything else for the good of Rotary? We are adjourned.